The 1940s are now over. Hitler's war is receding into history. More than ten years have passed, years that have witnessed sweeping changes in the British way of life. During that time, Nick Jenkins and his wife Isabel have settled in the country. Kenneth Widmerpool has married Charles Stringham's niece, Pamela. Still hungry for power and influence, he has entered the world of politics. And so the dance to the music of time moves on, carrying Nick and his friends into a future that is both uncertain and at times alarming. And a kiss And one stolen night of bliss One girl, one boy Some grief, some joy Memories are made of this Don't forget the small moonbeam Oh, it lightly with a dream Your lips and mine Two sips of wine Memories are made of me Does Mr. Sillery still have his old rooms? Lord Sillery? He does indeed, Mr. Jenkins. I keep forgetting the peerage. <laughs> One of the Labour government's happier creations. Yes, he's still in the same rooms. His life has scarcely changed in half a century. Come in. Come in. Lord Sillery. Yes? You probably don't remember me. Uh, Nicholas Jenkins. Many years ago, you used to give me rock buns and tea. My dear boy, I remember you extremely well. What a delightful surprise. Congratulations on the peerage. Oh, yes, it's absurd. Uh, you gather, my dear Nick, I didn't want the dreaded thing at all. I keep telling the college servants to go easy on all that melody. That makes me think I'm acting in a Shakespeare play. <laughs> so you'll take some tea. Oh, thank you. Now, you married one of the Tollen girls. Isabel. And you have children, is that right? Uh, yeah, two. Well, they're teenagers now. Oh. I've read a couple of your novels, nicely done. Not of the first rank, but then who is nowadays? <laughs> what are you doing in Oxford? Uh, researching a book on Robert Burton. Oh, interesting old gentleman, I've no doubt. Though it's years since I've looked into the anatomy of melancholy. Do, do, do sit down. <laughs> Have a rock bun. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Are you in touch with any of your contemporaries? Well, a few, yes. Um, Mark members, I see from time to time, and J.G. Quiggin. I saw Mark a few weeks ago, very distinguished, as striking in age as he was in youth. And no one got more out of being a professional young man than Mark while the going was good. Quiggin, I gather, has abandoned the pen, perhaps wisely, become a publisher. Is that true? Yes. He and his wife are starting a new literary magazine. Another literary magazine? Dear, oh dear. Well, this is it, Nick. The birthplace of Fission magazine. A bit small, I know, but we don't need anything bigger. All that matters is the quality of the work we do. Have a glass of wine. Thanks. We're determined to make Fission unique. Not just another literary magazine. We'll have essays and reviews, political commentary, short stories, of course, poetry, everything of the highest quality. Ex Trapnel has promised to write something for us. Do you know Ex Trapnel? Not personally. You must have read Camel Ride to the Tomb. Best first novel since the war. Yes, I enjoyed it very much. The political content is equally important. I've spoken to Kenneth Widmerpool, the Labour MP. He's very keen to be a contributor. You know the Widmerpools, don't you? They often speak of you. Kenneth's agreed to help us with the financial side of things. A damn good fellow to have around. Well, we're hoping you might write some reviews for us. Oh, I'd like that. We won't be able to pay much, I'm afraid. Talking of money, I should tell you, we've been consulting your wife's brother, Harry Warminster, about financing the magazine. <gasps> He's agreed to make a very substantial investment. I thought you 
said you'd never forgive him for running off with your girlfriend. That was years ago. Anyway, he's got me now. Indeed, I have, Ducks. Mm -hmm. Kenneth's gone down to see him this afternoon. All the legal stuff has to be signed before we can go any further. My name is Winterpool. I have a business appointment with Lord Warminster. I'm sorry, Mr. Winterpool, but his lordship died before lunch. Isabel will take you into the church. I'm going to park the car. Aren't you coming with us? Yes, I'm going to park the car. Well, isn't he coming with us? Alrighty. Hello, Isabel. Susan, tend to love. Thank you. Believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Thank you, good luck. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Who is that extraordinary woman? Widmerpool's wife. My dear Isabel, this is a very... A very sad occasion, yes. Mm. Poor Eri. Poor Eri. It was so... So unexpected, yes. Nick, I thought I must say hello. Though it's years since we met. You remember me, Mona. I used to be married to Peter Templer. What ages. Poor Peter, wasn't it sad? And poor Eri, too. I thought it was my duty to come. Dear darling Eri, I shall never forget Shanghai. Fancy Quiggin turning up today. It's so unexpected when he does the right thing for once. I'm married now. Did you know? It's Jeff's an air vice marshal. Isn't that grand? Burdened with gongs. <laughs> <laughs> I must scamper home now. We've got people coming to tea of all things. Jeff's quite insane about punctuality. Goodbye. Goodbye. So lovely to see you. Was that? Mona. Oh, of course. The girl Eric took to China. Mm. Have you seen Pamela? She's probably gone up to the house. <sighs> she had to leave the church. I hope no one noticed. These attacks come on her at times, largely nerves, in my opinion. I'm a bit worried about Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, the young woman who was unwell in the uh, 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 church. Yes, does their funerals upset her? They do. Some people, uh, beautiful young woman too. I, I couldn't help looking at her. <laughs> she must have thought me quite. <laughs> <laughs> what? I impertinent. <laughs> Hello, Pamela. Are you feeling better? Why should I be feeling better? I inquired as a formality. Don't feel bound to answer. 
Obviously, you weren't well in church. Worse than the bloody course. No, oh, Kenneth and those other sods on their way up. So I understand. Lady. Thank you, Smith. The uh, late Lord Warminster had a financial interest in the magazine our friend Quiggin proposes to publish. Is uh, your wife one of the executors? I don't think so. Who is, do you know? Why don't you ask her? Yes. Good idea, I will. What on earth is that Tory MP Cutts doing here? <laughs> it's another of my brothers in law. He's married to Susan. Thank you. Oh. I do hope you're feeling... What? What? You hope I'm feeling... What? Better! Are Widmerpool's political views as left-wing as Aries? Pretty well, yes. Poor old Aries. He obviously died at the wrong moment. Has he left you in the lurch? Oh, I wouldn't say that. But there are, of course, a number of financial matters that have to be sorted out. I can imagine. I gather you're one of the executors. I need to talk to you about the financial structure of this new magazine. As you know, the late Lord Warminster was very keen it should be published without delay. I'm feeling faint again. Yes, we'll go very soon. Kenneth, I must go now. Do let me finish this conversation. Why don't you go and lie down? You'll feel better I in a minute. I have to get out of here. I feel ghastly. Nick, Nick. Please, do very kindly escort Pam to the door. She's not feeling quite herself. I need to clarify a few points with your brother-in-law. Is the car outside? Yes, I expect so. Where's your coat? I don't know. By the door. I'm feeling sick. Shall we go back? Back where? To the bathroom. Give me a handkerchief. Come on. Wouldn't you like to go back for a moment? Of course not. Ah! Well, here, dear heart. Thought you'd have reached the car by now. Expect you're better, and Nicholas has been pointing out the objet d'art to you. It's the kind of thing he knows about. Rather fine, some of the pieces look to me. What's this great vase, is it? Chinese or Japanese? <laughs> Woefully ignorant of such matters. I intend to visit Japan as soon as the opportunity occurs to see what kind of job the Americans are doing out there. We have to keep an eye on Uncle Sam's mailed fist. Taxes are hard to find. Smart king? Who's the type on the knob, Dr. Goebbels? I'd like to think it was Boris Karlov in a horror role and a great admirer. Look. Don't fix bayonets, I beseech you, Trappy. Keep your bright steel for the social revolution. <laughs> so, this is a fish. Bloody stupid title. Who thought it up? Well, me, actually. Where's the booze? In the kitchen. My wife, um... Good kid. You ought to be congratulated. The first issue is very creditable. Thank you. <laughs> People think because a novel's invented, it isn't true. Exactly the reverse is the case. Because a novel's invented, it is true. Biography and memoirs can never be wholly true because they can't include every conceivable circumstance of what happened. The novel can do that. The novelist himself lays it down. His decision is binding. Nick, this is Odo Stevens. He'll be writing for us every month. Hello, Nick. Nice to see you. Did you read his story in Encounter? Stephen Spender was full of praise. Yes, it was very good. Well, I told you I was thinking of becoming a writer, but it seems I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> the autobiographer, for his part, is imprisoned by his own egotism. 
One knows far more about Balzac and Dickens from their novels than one knows about Rousseau and Casanova from their confessions. Have a cheese straw. Have a sausage. Thank you. You must be the Quiggan twins, hmm? I'm Amanda. I'm Belinda. Who are you? Mark Members. What a funny name. <laughs> Hello, Pam. Do you see that? Typical of Pam. What the hell is she doing here? Her husband's a contributor. Who's the uh, dark haired lady talking to Quiggin? Oh, that's Rosie Manor. She's putting money into the mag. Is she very uh, rich? So they say. I think I'll meet her. What is effective is art, not what is true, using the term in inverted commas. Take as an example James Joyce and Leopold Bloom. It may be acceptable to read of Bloom tossing off. A blow by blow account of the author doing so is hardly conceivable as interesting. No, quite. Been attending any more funerals? No. Have you? Mm. Just awaiting my own. Not imminent, I trust. Oh, I rather hope it is. Are you writing something for fiction? Me? Do I look like someone who would write for fiction? Well, actually, yes. You do, rather. <sighs> Who's she? Mrs. Widmerpool. What have you lost? My briefcase. I hid it away down here somewhere. Mm. I say, that friend of yours, Trapnell, he's an odd fellow, isn't he? He's a good writer. Yes, so I'm told. Ah, here it is. He asked me to lend him some money. An unusual request, I thought, bearing in mind I'd never set eyes on me before tonight. Did you come across? Oh, gave him a pound. The man assured me he was completely penniless. Where's Pam? She had to leave early dinner engagement. Ooh. I can see you're surprised that I should borrow money and then spend it immediately on a taxi cab. Taxis play an important role in my life. They provide essential security denied to the man on foot against bailiffs serving writs. Goodbye. Isabel tells me you've finished your book. It's taken you a long time. Far too long, but I've enjoyed it. Tell me about uh, Robert Burton. I'm ashamed to say I've never heard of him. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't obscure a 17th century scholar. Anatomy of Melancholy took him ten years to write. It's an extraordinary book. What's it about? Poetry, philosophy, travel, food, medicine, religion, art, morals, politics, love. Life. I will mention your name to the Italian ambassador. I'm dining with him tomorrow at Diana Cooper's. I didn't know you knew Lord Sillery. He was a dom and I was at Oxford. Remarkable man, extremely influential. Still, very much so. Gus, just the man I want to see. Evening, Nicholas. Hello, Kenneth. Something's come up regarding the war minister's state. It's nothing serious, just a rather tedious legal matter concerning his various bequests. Can we get it sorted out? I've got no status in this matter whatsoever. Do talk to the solicitors. No, 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 no. Let's cut corners and tackle it man to man. Come back to my flat. We can deal with the whole matter in less than half an hour. I brook no refusal cuts. Come along, live just round the corner. Go! Hmm. How's Mrs. Wimmerpool? I remember she was feeling unwell at the funeral. Thank you. My wife's health is much improved. In fact, during the last month, I've never known her in better spirits. Ah, oh, Pam's having a bath. She was expecting my return rather later than this. I'll just report who's here. Go along in, sit down. It's me. I'm back. Nick Jenkins and Roddy Cutts have come in for a drink. I expect Pat. 
time we'll look at later. Probably in her dressing gown, which I hope you'll excuse. Ah, she's been altering the pictures again. Pam loves doing that. She's always shifting that drawing her uncle Charles Stringham gave her. I can never remember the artist's name. It's Italian. Modigliani. Yes, yes, that's the one. Damn, who can that be? Not one of Pam's odd friends at this time of night. They're capable of anything. Don't let's waste our time here. Let's make our getaway while we can. How long ago did you say this was? Just before you came back. Yeah. I see. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Kenneth's neighbour. I live downstairs. Ah, yes. Something wrong. It was uh, very thoughtless of her to have forgotten to turn the bath tap off. A hot one, too. Everything steamed up. You know, Leonard, she must have decided to go away on the spur of the moment. Yes, that's what it looks like. I see she's taken both her suitcases. They must have been quite heavy. Most of her clothes have gone. Did you help carry them down? The man was carrying them. You mean the porter? I thought he was having flu. Not the regular porter. He might have been a taxi driver. What was he like? He had a beard. Rather a wild expression. And he had a curious walking stick under his arm. Did the knob look like a skull? Yes. Do you know him? Repeat to me again exactly what she said. Tell him I'm leaving and taking the Modigliani and the photographs of myself. He can do what he likes with the rest of my junk. Look, I, I'm sorry, Wimperpool. I really must be getting home. Perhaps we can discuss this Warminster business over a drink at the house? Yes, 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 of course, absolutely. Must apologise for this evening. There's nothing Pam enjoys more than mystifying people, especially her unfortunate husband. Are they actually living together? Mm, so it seems. But where? Chappie's place, presumably. Not that ghastly hole by the canal. Where else? Vision, can I help you? Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Well? Well what? Well what was all that about? It was a message from Mr Jenkins. Mr Trapnell wants to see him. He's not well and wants something to read in bed. Pamela. Come in. Hello, Nick. Awfully good of you to come. What have you brought me? Graham Green and Patricia Highsmith. I avoided Colin Wilson. Thank God for that. Have you a shilling? The fire's going out. My husband. I haven't seen him since the night you left. How was it taken? Well or badly? There was no scene. You must have been surprised by the turn of events. I was astonished. I told Nick I didn't take to you at all at the fishing party. I just thought I was the most awful girl you'd ever met. And what brought about the change? I was in Ada Quiggin's office, looking through my press cuttings. 
Pamela suddenly came in. She wanted to telephone right away. She completely ignored me. She went at once to the telephone and began cursing the girl on the switchboard for her slowness. When she got the number, she started bawling out some man who'd sent her a jar of pickled peaches as a present. She'd thrown them down the lavatory. She gave him help, poor chap. And that stole your heart away? Something did. I'm mad about her. Oh, God, that'll be the landlord. Take no notice. He'll go away in a minute. You answer the door. Say we've gone away. Tell them we've lent you the flat. <laughs> he won't believe that. Look. X can't possibly go out in his present state. Give him ten bob. Ah, Nicholas. I expect you're here on literary business. Don't go away from a mistaken sense of delicacy. Matters of a rather personal nature are likely to be discussed. I'm quite glad to have a witness, especially one conversant with the circumstances. Where's Trapnel? This way, I take it. Good afternoon. I've come to talk about the current situation. Would you oblige me by removing your hat from my book? Oh, I'm sorry. That sounded rude. I didn't mean it to be. I have a thing about my manuscripts. I hate them being treated like any old pile of waste paper. Please, uh, take off your coat and sit down. Thank you. I prefer standing. I shall not be staying long, so there's no point in my taking off my coat. How did you find the house? I came by taxi. I mean, how did you discover where I was living? There are such aides as private detectives. <laughs> I've always wanted to meet someone who employed a private detective. You may fear that I am going to institute divorce proceedings. Such is not my intention. Pamela will return in her own good time. I think we understand each other. That is what I came to tell you that and to express my contempt for the way you live and the way you have behaved. Get out! No dramatics, please. I said, are you going? I have no wish to stay. I shall be abroad for some weeks. As a member of parliament, I have been invited to enjoy the hospitality of some of the Eastern European governments. It might make an interesting article for fission. I said, get out! When I return, I shall not be surprised to find that you have reconsidered matters. Glad you were here, Nick. Now you know what my life's been like. So bugger off. I want to be alone with X. invited to a South American cocktail party. To what? Oh, oh, Colonel and Madame Flores invite you to a reception at the Ambassadorial Residence. Oh, that's Jean. Jean who? Jean Duport. Used to be Jean Templer, sister of Peter. Yes. One of your old flames. How very kind of you both to come. My dear fellow, I shall call you Nick if I may. Just as Jean does when she speaks of you. What will you have? Pink gin. My tipple too. Would you like some champagne? How lovely. General, bourbon? Or would you prefer a tequila? I have a bottle hidden away. Gin, sir. Oh, thank you. 
Your wife has so kindly asked us to dine with you, but I'm afraid we have to go home. There's been a change of government and a big reorganization. Promotion, I hope. Carlos has been given a military area in the northern province. It might lead to big things. It's, it's such a shame. I was hoping to spend some time with Polly. How is she? Living with her father at the moment, Bob Duport. She's an actress, did you know? She has ambitions to go into films. How well you speak English, Madame Flores. <laughs> yes. People are always asking if I was brought up in this country. <laughs> Your wife is delightful. Are you happy? Yes, very. Good. I'm glad. Don't tell me how to write my bloody book! Stick this to isn't the a book. It's shit. Bitch! Yes. Yes. Bitch, I'll kill you! Come back! Good afternoon, Mr. LeBau. I was in your house. What's your name? Nicholas Jenkins. What's your generation? Well, Fetty Place Jones was captain of the house when I arrived, and then there was Stringham, Templar, Cawthrop, Widmerpool. Oh, yes, Widmerpool. He's an MP, very left wing. What are you doing, Jenkins? I've just finished a book about Robert Burton, the man who wrote The Anatomy of Melancholy. Rather a morbid subject. Well played, Jenkins. Is that your boy who's playing on the wing? Yes. Thomas. Oh, he did very well against Winchester. I was most impressed. I was having lunch with Lord Sillery last week. He dropped a few dark hints about Kenneth Widmerpool. Said he'd been mixed up with Burgess and Maclean. Do you think that's possible? Well, anything's possible, I suppose. I don't believe he's a bugger, though, do you? Well, on the other hand, he has been very active promoting East-West trade. There's nothing wrong with that? No, no, no. Must have made a packet, though. I suppose he's got to do something to earn the pennies, having a wife like Pamela. Was that your son who scored the winning goal? Yes. Very good. A draw would have been most unsatisfactory. Games are played to be won, whatever people may say or write to the contrary. How's Isabel? Oh, fine, thank you. And Pam? In good order. I'm glad you two are back together. Oh, yes, I knew. Last momentary aberration. I've been talking to Labar. Have you seen him? Doesn't look a day older. Yes, we had a few words. I took the opportunity of giving him some account of my most recent visit to Eastern Europe. We hear so much about the Cold War and the Iron Curtain. It's all nonsense. I told him so. They couldn't be more friendly and cooperative. Oh, by the way, have you heard Fishin is closing down? Who told you that? Quiggin, the money's run out. They owe me £25. I'm not surprised. The literary world is very unreliable. Jump. What are you doing in this place, you derelict? I've come to collect these review copies before they're thrown away. It was here, Nick. Here, in this very room, that I first set eyes on her. La Belle Dame, sans merci. Every poke was a nightmare. 
She wants it all the time. She wants it, but she doesn't want it. She goes rigid like a corpse. It's almost the same. When her husband copes with it. She told me once she only tried it a couple of times. Gave it up as a bad job. You all right, Trappy? Absolutely. Got a check from the BBC this morning. Quite a decent one. Come and have a drink. I can't. I'm sorry. My last train goes in an hour. That book she threw in the canal. Best thing I've ever done. Work of genius. So the doctor said to me, what is the reason for your excessive drinking, Mr. Trapp? Most people drink to forget something unpleasant. What are you drinking to forget? I've forgotten, <laughs> I said. <laughs> so it works! <laughs> <laughs> Two! Oblivion! per darci ispirazione. Permettetemi ora di presentarvi il mio onorato collega, l'illustre critico e letterato, il signor Mark Members. Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf I would like to thank signor Fratelli and his committee for all the work they've done in organizing this conference. It will, I know, be an event of real importance, both culturally and politically, forging, I feel sure, sturdy chains of peace and comradeship and shared endeavor. Queen is nice, dear. Try it. Greeno, please. Mr. Jackets. That's right. My name is Gwyneth, Russell Gwyneth. I was hoping to meet you. I admire your novels very much. Thank you. <laughs> You're a fellow delegate, are you? An observer, not a delegate. I'm that most despised of animals, an American academic. <laughs> is this fresh? I believe you're a friend of the English writer X Trapham. Yes, I knew him. I'd already planned to get in touch with you, Mr. Jenkins. I'm preparing uh, a book on X Trapnel. A biography? A biographical and critical study, yes. There are a number of things I want to talk to you about. In particular, I'm very, very intrigued by this woman who went off with, the one who destroyed his last manuscript. Pamela Widmerpool. From what I hear, she seems to be something of a femme fatale. I, I'm never quite sure what that means. Well, I'm told she's had love affairs with the most extraordinary variety of people. Is that true, do you think? Almost certainly. Why hasn't her husband divorced her? I have no idea. He must enjoy being married to her, and she presumably to him. Yeah, I gather he was a Labour MP during her affair with Trapnell. That's right. He's a life peer now. So the femme fatale has become Lady Widmerpool? Oh, she has indeed. Nicholas Jenkins, how are you? Oh, Dr. Brightman. Do you know Mr. Gwynnett? Oh, yes. Russell is an old friend from my transatlantic days. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I'm afraid I have some sad and distressing news to tell you. I've just heard that our distinguished colleague, Leon Joseph Ferrand Seneschal, has died very suddenly in London. Many of you, I'm sure, will wish to pay your own tribute to this great man of the left. 
his output was truly remarkable. Novels, plays, economic and philosophic studies, political tracts, and even when young, a much admired volume of verse. I would like to suggest we observe a moment of silence to honor the man and his work. It was a stroke. He was in bed. An hotel in Kensington. In the afternoon. A woman was with him. Well, of course. Oh, look at this. A long article about Ferdinand Seneschal. Oh, what a truly ugly man he was. Did you ever meet him? Yes, once. Had very fleshy lips. On a girl, they might have been thought sensual, but on a man, oof. Repellent. You know what he likes. Little girls. Two way mirrors. Chained to a crucifix. The early books are ridiculously stilted, and the later ones are grossly slipshod. Isn't that the one we were talking about? Trapman's girl? It is. The implication is that she was in bed with Ferrand Seneschal when he died. A soifé de plaisir, dévoré de désir. Mm. Delicious and scandalous. How unchanged remains the French view of English life. Phlegmatic, sadistic aristocrats moving silently and coldly from one atrocity to another through the fogs of La Pac and Les Jardins de Kensington. <laughs> Doesn't actually say Lady Whitmerpool was with him when he died. It said that she visited him in the hotel and since his sexual habits are so notorious, the implication cannot be ignored. Well, I'll say good night. What's happening tomorrow? We were all invited to visit the Palazzo Bragadin. It's never open to the public. Our conference is greatly favored. Right. Is that the Jackie Bragadin one reads about in gossip columns? It is. There's a famous ceiling. Veronese, I think. Tiepolo. It's been kept virtually a secret. The subject caused a lot of trouble when it was painted. Why is that? Wait till you see it. OK. Well, sleep well. I'll see you both tomorrow. Good night. Good night. What do you make of Russell? I quite like him. Had he been an English undergraduate, his rooms would have been equipped with black candles, skulls, the odor of incense. He likes death. That atmosphere is not the American tradition. There was some kind of trouble, tragedy. When he was in his early college days, a girl he was friendly with committed suicide. At least she seems to have committed suicide. Perhaps it was an accident. I think this is the best way. Good heavens. Polly Duport. Who's she? I knew her mother. Louis Glober's a house guest at the Palazzo. Louis Glober? And he's a film producer, big name in Hollywood. Oh. <laughs> Do you know him? No. No, I just read a paragraph about him in the Continental Herald Tribune. Said he was in Venice for the film festival, staying at Palazzo Braggadin. Seems Glober's come on here from the German Grand Prix. Racing. Automobile racing, world championship. He's in that game, too. Sure. Senator. Thank you. Morning, Nicholas. Morning, Russell. Follow me. I've ascertained the whereabouts of the Tiepolo and will lead you to it. School of Veronese, the drunkenness of Lot. The daughter on the left greatly resembles a pupil of mine. Come on. We mustn't tarry or the mob will be upon us. Hello, Pamela. Hello. Jackie didn't mention you were staying. I'm not staying here. I'm at the writers' conference. God, how ghastly. Louis Glover. Nick Jenkins. The only way you can see it properly is lying down. <laughs> What's happening up there, do you know? Candaules was king of Lydia, Gyges his chief officer and personal friend. Candaules was always boasting to Gyges of the beauty of his wife. 
finding him insufficiently impressed, the king suggested that Gaiji should conceal himself in their bedroom and observe the queen, naked. Unfortunately for Kandaulis, the queen noticed the boyar stealing away. We see her doing so above, and was understandably incensed. She sent for Gaijis the following day and presented him with two alternatives. Either he could kill the king and marry her, on Skontanos, or she would arrange for Gaijis himself to be done away with. In the latter event, familiarity with her unclothed beauty would die with him. What did he do? Killed Kandaulis and married the queen. They lived and ruled happily for 40 years. I bet it wasn't like that at all. I bet the king just liked people to watch him screwing. Some men do. Pam! What are you doing here? You're the last person I expected to see. You're surely not a member of the conference. I'm staying here, in the palazzo, with Mr. Braggadin. Of course. Is Kenneth with you? He's arriving today. I must congratulate him on becoming a lord. And you too, darling. <laughs> Pam, I want you to meet Russell Gwinnett. He's very keen to talk to you. I'm writing a book on X Travnel. Poor X. You ought to talk to Louis about this new film. What new film? I keep telling Louis he should make a film of the Travnel novel that got destroyed. X himself said it would make a good film. Did you read it? Of course. And do you remember it? Absolutely. Have a close bearing on Trapnel's own life, would you say? Extremely close. Um, I want a word in private at once. Do go away. Can't you see I'm in the middle of an important conversation with Mr. Winnett? How far have you got with the book? At the moment, I'm concentrating in Talion research. Nicholas. Nicholas. How are you? Congratulations on the peerage. Oh, thank you very much. Didn't want to leave the commons, no one less, but I'm enjoying my work in the upper chamber. Are you here on business? Yes. No. Not really. Pamela wanted a short rest. As it happens, my normal activities are rather impeded at the moment by a number of irksome matters. Indeed, one domestic tragedy. My mother passed away a few days ago at her cottage in Kukubrisha. I'm sorry. She reached a ripe old age. The end was not unexpected. Unfortunately, it was impossible for me to make a journey as far as Scotland at this particular moment. At the same time, it was painful to leave a matter like my mother's burial in the hands of a secretary, competent though my secretary happens to be. Nonetheless, that's what had to be done. I couldn't be in Kukubusha and Venice at the same time, and much as I disliked the place, I had to come to Venice. You must be attending this writer's conference. How long has it been going on? Three days. I suppose you meet and mix with the other delegates, the foreign ones, I mean? Some of them. Have you come across a... a Dr. Belkin? One of the Soviet delegates? He is known to me only by name through certain cultural societies to which I belong. He was also, incidentally, a friend of poor Ferrand Sénéchal. How sad that was. Belkin? Dr. Belkin? Heard anything of him? You won't find your friend Belkin here. What do you mean? Has somebody told you something? If so, what? You only know about Belkin because you've heard me speak of him. <laughs> it wasn't what you said. That's what Leon Joseph said. You mean before he... No, after he died. Leon Joseph appeared to me as a ghost last night. He had his head underneath his arm like Mary Queen of Scots. I recognized him by the blubber lips and rimmed the spectacles. The blubber lips spoke the words, Belkin has been fucked because of his Stalinist beliefs. Is this true? 
Did he really say something of the kind before he died? Being Leon Joseph, he said it in French. À cause de ses sentiments, Stalinistes, Belkin et... Why on earth didn't you pass this on? Why should I? Why should you know how important it is, the whole point of making this contact? The consequences. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. What are you looking at? Answer my question. This is a serious matter. There's a painting up there of a man exhibiting his naked wife to a friend. Have you looked at it? I know you can't tell one picture from another and you have no idea why people put them in frames or hang them on their walls. You probably think they conceal safes with them, with money in them, or dirty books and postcards. However, this particular painting is worthy of your attention, Kenneth. It might, for instance, remind you of the photographs in the secret drawer of that desk you sometimes forget to lock. I only discovered them a few days ago. I had no idea you'd take them. Wasn't that innocent of me? How Leon Joseph laughed when I told him. I think perhaps we should move into the next room. I know Mr. Braggadin is most anxious for us to see the Canalettos. How'd you get on with Pamela? She's agreed to talk about travel. Good. Where do you think she's arranged to meet? No idea. Guess. Harris Bar? In the Basilica. So punctual. I'll try not to take up too much of your time. No doubt you're expected back at the Palazzo Bradigan for dinner. They'd be only too pleased if they saw neither of us ever again. Why is that? Do you want guests like the wooden pools? One suspected of murder, the other of spying? Isn't this an extraordinary place? long for the religious life. Don't you feel the same? Frankly, no. I'm not drawn to it myself. Your clothes have much more religious flavor than the ones you're wearing at the palazzo. Perhaps you're thinking of taking the veil? Huh. <laughs> I'm often very moved by religious thoughts. Does that surprise you? No, no, actually, it doesn't. What do you drink, Mrs. Quigger? A Negroni, with an urgent request for plenty of gin. <laughs> How are the twins? They're at school now. Star water. Star water? Sir Magnus Donner's old house. It's become a girls' school, didn't you know? Louis. I shall call you Louis, Mr. Glover. Louis has come to Europe to look for a story for a film. He wants something nostalgic and Edwardian, and I had the brilliant idea that St. John Clark was the answer. I thought you were thinking of X Trapman. We're considering a number of possibilities at this moment. I gather the Thomas Hardy film's a huge success. They say Polly Duport is brilliant. Yes, so I hear. I'm having lunch with her on Friday. The man that I was talking about, uh, Dr. Belkin, you, you haven't come across him, I suppose. There's a small package I need to deliver. Why don't you ask one of them? Oh, how observant of you, Nicholas. Not here, I think, perhaps later. Yeah, it's all. 
What about this American Pam's taken a fancy to? <laughs> Has she taken a fancy to him? He's writing a book about ex trapnel Will it be any good? Ought we to publish it? Perhaps you should. Pam asked Louis if he thought Gwyneth was queer. That worried him, a possible sexual interest. Is he queer? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think he's very normal either. <laughs> <laughs> Glober doesn't want Gwyneth hanging around if he's doing a trapnel film. That's why he's begun to look for another subject. He wants to marry Pam, not just have an affair with her. Marry her? But what about Kenneth? Has he been consulted? Oh, it's all a big secret. Don't breathe a word. But why should Pam want to marry Glober? Well, she thinks he's going to give her the lead in this new film he's going to make. She's never acted in her life. <laughs> Does that matter? She longs for fame. Nobody's ever heard of her. She doesn't like that. Mm. Oh, excuse me. So how was your meeting with Femme Fatale? She grabbed hold of me. You mean? Just that. By the balls? Yeah. Literally? Quite literally. And then she hinted that all those rumors about her and Farron Seneschal were true. How amazing. Yeah. She also told me she thinks her husband's a spy. Do you think he is? I'm no longer surprised by the Widmer pools. She told me to call her up when I get to London. And will you? Of course. gentleness uh, of the C major opening must be shattered by, by, by strange, heathen sounds. We must be shocked, gentlemen. Please, try it again. Why are we going to this? You'll enjoy it when you get there. Well, you know I can't stand Dodo Stevens. I doubt very much if you're even seen. It's being held in his house. In his wife's house. Poor Rosie Manners. I can't think why she married him. You'll enjoy the music. And it'll be good to see Hugh Morland again. How are you, Hugh? Everything all right? I'm exhausted before I've even begun. <laughs> Have another brandy. Good idea. Don't look now, there's Polly Duport and Louis Glover. I'm bored to death with both of them. Are they in love? Hello, Absolutely. Darling. He saw her in that Hardy film at the Venice Festival. It was an instantaneous click. What happened about Pam? Oh, she was already mad about that other American, you know, Russell Gwinnett. His book on x is never going to sell. Why, Why do we get involved in it, money down the drain? Hello, Isabel. Oh, Roddy. Mm. Hello, Nick. How nice to see you. Fiona, dear. How pretty you look. This is my brother-in-law, Roddy Cutts, his daughter Fiona, Mr and Mrs Quiggin. Hello, how do you do? How do you do? 
I think we met years ago at Lord Warminster's funeral. Quite right. So we did. What a lovely dress. Oh, thanks. It's La Chasse. Mummy always goes there. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Nicholas. Hello, Kenneth. Hello, Pamela. Two. I hear Widmapur's so-called business deals in Eastern Europe have come under official scrutiny. Yes, he was damn lucky. The government hushed it up. They didn't want another scandal. Typical Widmapur luck. Oh, what a shit Odo is. I like his wife. Yeah, she's all right. Probably gets a kick out of keeping the little pumps. The Widmapools are here. How frightening she looks. Wer ein Liebchen hat gefunden, die es treu und redlich meint, lohn es hier durch tausend Küsse, mach ich all das Leben süße, sei Tröster, sei Freund, sei Tröster, sei Freund, sei mir Freund, Fancy meeting you here. Oh. What a hell of a good time we had in Venice. <laughs> You're a Polly Dupont. Yes, hello. Oh, this is my wife, Isabel. Isabel. Hello. A real pleasure. How are you, Polly? Very well. We're making a film of one of St. John Clark's books. Didn't you know him? A little. How's your mother? She's all right. She lives in South America now. Her husband, Colonel Flores, is head of the government. A dictator? We don't call it that. Your mother must enjoy being a dictatress. Or should I say a dictatrix? Nicholas, <laughs> 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 remember me, Jimmy Stripling. Jimmy, hello. How are you keeping these days? Oh, I can't say I enjoy old age. It's like being increasingly penalised for a crime you've never committed. <laughs> are you one of these musical people? I expect so. I don't know a thing about Mozart's operas or anyone else's, but Mara wanted to come. Mara and I. A very good friend. Uh, I must do what she wants. She's such a wonderful person. <laughs> Nicholas. And you, my dear, you must be... My wife. Libra. Pisces, but she rebels against it. Oh, remember always, the fishes are ruled by Jupiter. Give no credence to Neptune. When first I read your husband's poem, I told him you two would meet and all would be well. How reassuring. Did I see you talking to that American fellow, Glober? He's keen on vintage cars. Are you interested in cars? Well, I possess one, but that's all. Oh, I've loved them all my life. Love is the only word. That's why your marriage wasn't a success. <laughs> Absolutely right. I loved cars over well. I'm too old to race them anymore, but I study them and collect them. That fellow Glober has got a four and a half litre supercharged pendulum. <laughs> Long-winded, I thought. I can never get the hang of opera. I'm sorry, Kenneth. I plainly instructed the driver to be waiting outside. The driver must have mistaken the address. If so, he'll be along in a minute or two. Ah, 
Nicholas. Have you by any chance got a car? Our hired vehicle hasn't turned up. Leonard has made some sort of muddle. I suppose you couldn't give us a lift. We're going to pick up a taxi. Oh. Why don't you do the same? Go to the street at the end. You'll find plenty of taxis there. Pam doesn't want to walk that far. What blast! Why did this have to happen? If you should see a hired car waiting around the corner, please ask the chauffeur if he's booked in the name of Sir Leonard Short, will you? He may have mistaken the address. Come and have a look at the Bentley. It's parked at the end of the block. Thank you very much. What a treat. An amazing car, the size of a bus. Ah. Oh. Excuse me, I couldn't help overhearing, but if your car really is so commodious, I wonder if you could give us a lift. We are a party of three, and we all live in the Westminster direction, if you happen to be going that way. Sure, no problem. Very kind. Uh, we met in Venice, if you remember. Of course. I hear you're going to star in Louis' new film. Yes, that's right. You'll enjoy that enormously. I'm sure I will. You mean because all the girls love Louis? He's very popular with everyone. Indeed he is. I expect you know that he's stuffed a cushion with hair snipped from the pusses of the ladies he's had. You have, haven't you, Louis? Have what, honey? Stuffed a cushion. Sure. Along with the ladies themselves. Correct. I thought Miss Duport ought to know what's expected of her. Perhaps I'm too late. Perhaps you've already been at work with the Nelsons. Still, at least it's a cheaper hobby than yours. <laughs> My dear Beware, you are near the abyss. You stand at its utmost edge. You know. Huh? <sighs> you know. <gasps> Marvellous. You know, you know Leon Joseph croaked in bed with me. <sighs> yes, you know, it's true. <gasps> Nobody else quite believes it, but you know. <sighs> oh, why don't you tell them? You were there, after all. You thought I wouldn't spot him watching through the curtain. He likes to watch his wife being screwed, you see. <laughs> Wasn't the first time. He'd arranged it all before with Leon Joseph. Except the popping off. <gasps> that took both of us by surprise. <laughs> Leon Joseph, too. I expect he was very surprised. <laughs> <gasps> Don't you dare touch me, you American brick. Oh. Any of you gentlemen, Sir Leonard Short? Yes, I am Sir Leonard Short. I should like an explanation. I cannot understand why this car is so late. Oh, sorry about that, sir. I went to the wrong address. Uh, there's a terrace, uh, and a place, and a gate. Here. Very confusing. Out of the door. Fine. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Where's Lady Widmerpool? She seems to have vanished. Let's show them the Bentley. Oh. Nice. 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 Nick! Nick! Hugh Morland's been taken ill. What happened? He's had a blackout and fell. It doesn't look too good. Well, where is he? He's upstairs in the study. Oh, I've sent for the doctor. Hugh, how are you? Drinking bloody water. It shows how serious it is. What's the matter? Too much Mozart. I tell them to take it easy with all those C major chords. Absolutely spun me over like a nine pin. she did it to satisfy Gwyneth's secret desires? Well, it's possible. Oh, fascinating. Never come across a necrophiliac before. 
Necrophiliac. We don't know for sure that he's a necrophiliac. And she took an overdose, told Gwynedd, and lay there like a bride. That's the rumour. Literally dying for love. What's happened to him? Is he in trouble? Oh, no. Nobody suggested he was responsible in any way. He's gone to Spain. I gather he intends working as a water skiing instructor. Uh, other people's sexual relations are hard to imagine. Quiggin was telling me about the goings-on which Lady Woodmerpool revealed so flamboyantly. I've no voyeurist tastes myself. I lack the love of power that makes a true voyeur. It was Magnus Donner's thing, you know. By the by, have you seen the evening paper? The Grim Reaper is much in evidence. That fellow Glober, I think you said you knew him. Who are they? The owner's friends. Roddy and Susan telephoned last night, I told you. The bucket. Bring the bucket, Fiona. Give me the gloves, Barnabas. And they're travelling in that caravan? Apparently. What do you think they're doing? Catching crayfish, I suppose. Fiona! What has she done to her hair? Such a shame. She looked so pretty at the opera. Isn't Roddy worried about her? I mean, if I were her father, I wouldn't let her go wandering off with people like that. Yes, they do look rather scruffy. The one in the blue smock seems to be in charge. She calls him Scorp. Roddy said he's something of a mystic. He gets up early and meditates. He used to be in the antique business. I believe in harmony. You mean in the musical sense? Harmony is not easy to define. Harmony is power. Power is harmony. That's how you see it? That's how it is. Where are Thomas and Caroline? Who are they? My cousins. Thomas is at Harvard Law School and Caroline is being an au pair in Aix-en-Provence. Give them my love? Yes, of course I will. Are you sure I can't get you something to eat? Today is a day of limited fast. Where are you off to next? That's up to school. We go where the power takes us. But first we shall spend some time at the Stones. The Stones? Up on the hill? Do you mean the Devil's Fingers? The Devil's Fingers? Ah, so it has a name. <sighs> That's what the locals call it. Mm, a place of ancient magic. I can feel it in the air. Have you ever known a stag mask dance to have been performed there? I've never heard of it, no. Do have another biscuit. Darling, it's Hugh.
don't you? The Quiggan twins. Who? Oh. Amanda and Belinda. <laughs> Why did they do it? God knows, some kind of student demonstration, I suppose. Uh, would you excuse me? Quiggan! I shouldn't be here. I've got a bad throat. I'm feeling rotten. Mm. I gather your daughters are coming this evening. What? Haven't you heard? Amanda and Belinda are coming here. Mm. Kenneth Whitmerpool asked if he could bring them. There seemed no objection. Why the buggery is Whitmerpool coming? He's one of the trustees of the Magnus Donner's Prize Fund. Bloody hell, why didn't you tell oh, us before, do but... shut up about the girls, JG. They're all right. There's no harm in them being friendly with Whitmerpool. Here's the chance of their solid university, after all. They might easily have been sent down if it hadn't been for him. Will Russell Gwynnett be here tonight? Well, of course. All the way from America. And I thought he despised literary gatherings. There's nothing like winning a prize to make you change your mind. Mm, I wonder how Whitmerpool will react to Gwynnett's book. You find it awfully painful, won't you, all that stuff about Pamela? I raised this with him. He said he couldn't care a fart. His very words. Where the hell is Gwynnett? It might be better if he doesn't show up. Various potential embarrassments might be avoided. But the prize giving? We could easily go through the motions in absentia. The presence of the author is not required for voicing correct sentiments about his book. <laughs> Here he is. Russ, how are you? Isn't it nice that you've won the prize? <laughs> Congratulations. You've produced a work that deserves it. Thank you, Emily. There's something you should know. Kenneth Widmerpool is coming tonight. Fine, no problem. I believe you write books, don't you? I haven't read any of them. I read very little. I'm only here because my husband is the director of the Magnus Donners Trust. Do tell me about that man with the two girls. Sure I ought to know who they are. Isn't it a famous author and his two daughters? No, he's not an author. He's called Lord Widmerpool. Not the Lord Widmerpool. I've seen him on television. He didn't look at all like that. Perhaps he was well made up. Are the girls his daughters? No, he never had any children. He's the chancellor of their university. They threw paint over him a few weeks ago. And now they're all friends? So it seems. Is this what they call the permissive society? Excuse me. Hello, Russell. Many congratulations. Thank you, Nicholas. I enjoyed your book on Robert Burton very much. Oh, thank you. You know, I've always loved The Anatomy of Melancholy. It's my favorite book. My favorite title. <laughs> Sorry, Nicholas. Russell, would you come and have your photograph taken? Yeah, of course. Excuse me. Mr. Jenkins, I'm Paul Fenno. I understand we have a mutual friend, Scorp Mertlock. Well, scarcely a friend. I've only met him once. Said you were most hospitable. How did he come to be christened Scorp? No, sure for Scorpio. His zodiac sign. His real name is Leslie. Well, I've known him since he was a child. He once sang in my choir. That was when I was in South London. Beautiful little boy. Quite exceptional, sir. So. And very intelligent. Alan Fenno, I think? Yes. May I introduce myself? My name is Whitmerpool. Ken Whitmerpool. I'm called Lord Whitmerpool by some. Don't bother about the Lord. Uh, Nick Jenkins here will vouch for my credentials. We've known each other more years than I care to remember. I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying. I myself am most interested in Scorp Murtlock. Oh, he's a very interesting young man. Yes. A genuinely rebellious personality. I admire that. Such people are rarer than one might think even today. His way of life may not be my own, but I am in sympathy with his determination to revolt. Perhaps a meeting or at least the forwarding of a letter might be arranged through your good self. If you really wish that, Lord Widmerpool, though, I advise against. Why is that? Well, charming as Scorpio can be in certain moods, he has what can only be called a darker side. I cannot advise contact with him to anyone not well-versed in the mysteries in which he traffics. And not always then. I think I am something of an expert in the ways of young people at least as tricky to handle as Master Murtlock. Then I will do my best. Thank you. How very odd. Why do you say that? Well, us talking about Scorp and Widmerpool wanting to meet him. To those familiar with the rhythm of living, there are few surprises in this world. Not only is Lord Widmerpool anxious to meet Scorpio, 
Scorpio has already spoken of his intention to make himself known to Lord Whitmerpool. <laughs> what on earth for? Scorpio's plans are not always crystal clear. We live in a world where much remains unrevealed. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a speechmaker, <laughs> just the chairman of this year's Magnus Donner's Award Committee. And it's in that capacity I take great pleasure in giving the award to Professor Russell Gwynnett, author of a very fine biography, Death's Head Swordsman. Professor Gwynnett. Thank you, Dr. Brightman. I've admired Trapnell's work ever since I read a short story of his in an American magazine. I lost no time in immersing myself in everything he had ever written. And shortly thereafter, I formed this ambition to write about the man himself. My greatest regret is that I never met ex Trapnell in the flesh, though perhaps the flesh is unimportant when one measures it against the creative impulse. I've called my book Death's Head Swordsman because Trapnell's sword stick seemed to symbolize the way he faced the world. Winner. Judges, guests, there is more than one reason why I am addressing you tonight without invitation. In the first place, I would like to take this opportunity to announce the fact that I was the husband of the woman who destroyed the wretched author Trapnell's manuscript book, or whatever it was she destroyed. Some of you, not I hope the younger section of my audience, may be surprised at my drawing attention to the fact that I was the so-called betrayed husband, once looked upon as discreditable and derisory. I go further than proclaiming that fact to you. I take pride in ridiculing what is, or rather was, absurdly called honor respectability, law, order, obedience, custom, rule, hierarchy, all that is insidiously imposed by the ideologically, morally, and spiritually naked and politically bankrupt on those they have oppressed and do oppress. I'm grateful to the author of this book, the title of which escapes me for the moment, for bringing home to so large an audience the irrelevance of such concepts in this day and age, and for giving me the opportunity to express at a gathering like this the wrongness of the way we live, the wrongness of marriage, the wrongness of money, the wrongness of education, the wrongness of government, and the wrongness of the way we treat kids like these. I have brought these kids with me for a very special reason. They're the ones who threw paint over me in my capacity as university chancellor. It was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. I was taking part in a piece of pompous and meaningless ceremonial which my own good sense and social opinions should have taught me to avoid. Even now, there are marks of red paint on my body. May they remain there until my dying day as a memorial to my weak spirit. These kids are right to have abandoned the idea that they can get somewhere without violence. Festering diseases need sharp surgery. 
these kids were articulate in their way. And in a different manner, the book by Professor. Professor, this book, the one that won the prize, has crystallized my views. I thought I heard something. Heard what? Sounded like people singing. There's nobody there. Mr. Jenkins, how nice to see you again. You and your wife were so good about our turning up with that awful man, Murtlock. We were crayfishing, do you remember? I hope you like the pictures. I think they're rather good. Deacon is one of my own discoveries. I used to know him. Deacon? He was a friend of my father's. Hey, Barney, could you come through? Mr. Duport wants a word. Yes, in a moment. We have some rather interesting people in the other room. The actress, Polly Duport, and her parents. We're showing his collection of marine paintings. He's decided to sell. Wisely, I think. I expect you've seen Polly Duport in the Strindberg play. 
So nice to have her back in the theatre again. I know Polly Duport and her father. Do you? You won't know her mother. She's lived most of her life in South America. Looks like one of those sad Goya duchesses. Mr. Henderson. Excuse me. Hello, Nick. Hello, Jean. Have you come to see Edgar's pictures? I can't remember your name. I can't remember anybody's name these days, including my own most of the time. Nick Jenkins. Nick, of course. You remember Jean? She's Madame Flores now. And Polly. Hello. Hello. I've gone down the drain. All started in the Middle East, jippy tummy. Look at me now, shunted round in a bath chair, penny for the guy. That's how I feel. One of the things I remember about you is that you know that chateau bottle shit Widmerpool. <laughs> That's right, I do. Polly saw him knocked out by an American film star. Wish I'd been there to shake him by the hand. He wasn't really knocked out, Papa, just his specs broken. And Louis Glober wasn't a film star. But he looked like one. Poor Louis. Oh, it was something to break that bastard's glasses. I'd have castrated him too if I had the chance. Not much to remove, though, I'd guess. How are you, Nick? You're looking well. How's your wife? I liked her so much. I was sorry to hear about... Don't start being sympathetic about Colonel Flores. Carlos didn't do too badly. At the time of his life, while the going was good, then went out instantaneously. He's a lucky devil. I envy him like hell. What do you think of all these Roman queers? Pretty bloody awful, eh? My sea pictures are much better. Do you remember how your brother always used to grumble about looking after my paintings for me when I was in low water and had no way to put them? He used to hang them in the dining room of that house he had in Maidenhead. Do you remember the pictures in the dining room, Nick? Peter's Maidenhead house was where we met. And played planchette. Yes, I played planchette. Oh. I think we'd better go home now, Papa. Mm, what? Time to go home. Oh, yes, I am feeling a little tired. Good Lord! Fancy meeting you here. Oh, for the life of me, I can't remember your name. Nick Jenkins. Of course. One of the things I remember about you is you know that chateau bottle shit Widmerpool. Quite right. What's he doing these days? Is he still alive? Um. our meditation. Yes, I'm sorry. Why are you so clumsy, Ken? It was an accident, I'm sorry. It was not an accident. It was your clumsiness. Yes, I'm sorry. You must make amends. Yes, of course. You will apologize to the disciples. Yes, I do. I apologize most humbly. One by one. You will apologize to them one by one. You will kiss their feet to show how truly contrite you are. Very well, Ken. You may begin. Yes, Scott. Thank you, Scott.
I'm running. I've got to keep it up. Stop it. Slow down. This isn't a race. You can't stop me. Now I'm leading. I'm leading. Ken! Ken, where are you? In his will, Widmerpool appointed me his literary executor. I found this rather surprising. And apart from two or three articles for fission, I wasn't aware that he'd ever actually written anything. As I opened drawers and looked at bookshelves, as I examined the detritus washed up on the seashore of Widmerpool's life, I remembered a torrential passage from Robert Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy. I hear news every day, and those ordinary rumors of war, plagues, fires, inundations, thefts, murders, massacres, meteors, comets, spectrums, prodigies, apparitions of towns taken, cities besieged in France, Germany, Turkey, Persia, Poland, etc. Daily musters and preparations and such like, which these tempestuous times afford. Battles fought, so many men slain. Shipwrecks, piracies and sea fights, peace, leagues, stratagems and fresh alarms. A vast confusion of vows, wishes, actions, edicts, petitions, lawsuits, pleas, laws, proclamations, complaints, grievances are daily brought to our ears. New books every day, pamphlets, stories, whole catalogues of volumes of all sorts, New paradoxes, opinions, schisms, heresies, controversies in philosophy, religion, etc. Now come tidings of weddings, maskings, mummeries, entertainments, jubilees, embassies, tilts and tournaments, trophies, triumphs, revels, sports, plays. Then again, as in a new shifted scene, treasons, cheating tricks, robberies, Enormous villainies in all kinds. Funerals, burials, deaths of princes, new discoveries, expeditions, now comical, then tragical matters. Today, we hear of lords and officers created. Tomorrow, of some great men deposed. And then again, of fresh honors conferred. One is let loose, another imprisoned. One purchaseth, another breaketh, he thrives. His neighbor turns bankrupt. Now plenty, then again dearth and famine. One runs, another rides, wrangles, laughs, weeps, etc. Is it that civilized humanity can make the world so wrong? In this hurly burly of insanity, our dreams cannot last long. We've reached a deadline, a press headline, every sorrow, blues, value. 
is news value tomorrow. The loaf to any century blue. They're getting me down. Who's escaped those weary 20th century blues? Why, if there's a god in the sky, why shouldn't he grin? I, above this dreary 20th century den. In this strange illusion, chaos and confusion, people seem to lose their way. What is there to strive for, love or keep alive for? Say hey, hey, call it a day. Blue, nothing to win or to lose. It's getting me down. Ooh. Escape those dreary 20th century blues. <laughs> 20th century blues. <laughs> 